So uh, thank you all for coming to our Office of Public Records uh, Martin Luther King Remembrance Program. Um, of course, not Martin Luther King Jr. Day Program because it's a little late. <laughs> but <laughs> we still wanted to honor and recognize Martin Luther King and his uh, legacy. And so to start our program, I would like to introduce the uh, Secretary of the District of Columbia, Kimberly Bassett, who will bring greetings. Oh, let's oh, you're muted. Yes, I got it. Hi, everyone. Um, this is so exciting. Um, we're, we've had Lopez Matthews in our office for almost six months, and it seems like four years. <laughs> um, he's accomplished more in six months than, you know, many directors um, that we've had in the past, and we're just proud to have him. We're proud to have a true historian, um, somebody who understands D.C., um, our culture, our heritage, our our people, and it's been such a blessing to have someone with the cultural sensitivity um, that is needed. Um, and Mayor Bowser is, um, is um, pleased as well to have him here. And so I'm going to um, move on from that and say I am very, very, very happy um, that um, Marjorie has joined us today. I've read your bio. I see all the amazing accomplishments that you have made, and we appreciate what you've contributed to this city, to our culture, to our history. And um, I look forward to this discussion. And um, all I can say is keep winning. I mean, you look fabulous. Oh, thank we you. aspire. <laughs> we aspire. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Secretary. And uh, I would also, before we start the program, like to uh, just acknowledge Elizabeth Clark Lewis, the director of the Public History Program at Howard University, who is in the audience today. So thank you always for your support, Dr. Clark Lewis, and coming up with great ideas for programs to help support the Office of Public Records. Uh, so thank you. Um, and she's also the dissertation advisor for both myself and Dr. Kennard, who's on the call here. So, hey, Dr. Thank Clark you for Lewis. That. <laughs> Dr. Clark. Hi. Hey, Hi, doctors. <laughs> hey, good to see you. So, uh, to begin our program, I would just like to read a brief bio of um, Mrs. Kennard. Uh, Marjorie A. Kennard is a much sought after speaker, community activist, and fundraiser. She has been an educator in the public schools of the District of Columbia and an administrator at Livingstone College as Director of Alumni Affairs, Director of Enrollment Management, and Dean of Student Affairs. At Barbara Scotia College, she served as Director of Public Relations. After retirement, she was involved in the field of early childhood education as Director of the Shiloh Baptist Church Childhood Development Center in Washington, D.C. She was employed at the East of the River Health Association Community Healthcare Inc. as Director of Special Projects, Director of Adolescent Healthcare, Executive Assistant to the Director and Director of Marketing. She also moderated the weekly radio show Health Talk on WYCB. She served for six years as historian for the Washington, D.C. Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Inc. And right now, she coordinates the Woodlawn Collaborative Project which was conceived by the Heritage and Archives Committee of the Washington, D.C. Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta, the Washington, D.C. Chapters of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. <laughs> we're invited to join in preserving. I couldn't read. Really, I couldn't. I couldn't. I didn't want to do it in my introduction. <laughs> it's okay, Kimberly. I love it. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so they working to restore the Woodlawn Cemetery in Washington, D.C. And joining us to facilitate the conversation with Mrs. Kennard is her daughter, Dr. Joy Kennard, the superintendent of the Selma to Montgomery Historic Site and the Tuskegee University Historic Site in Montgomery, Alabama, and also a member of Delta Sigma Theta. <laughs> <laughs> and so without further ado, I will uh, Give it away to Joy. Um, at the end of our conversation, we will have a Q&A. And so if you would like to speak, raise your hands and I will give you permission to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. So with that, I will turn off my camera and 
pass it on over to you, Joy. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthews. It is an honor to be here in supporting um, your charge um, and all the work you're doing in um, the District of Columbia. Uh, I just want to say it's an honor to be here with you all today um, and to be interviewing my favorite person on the face of the earth, my mother, Marjorie Kennard. I actually share her with two sisters, Sarah and Hope Kennard. Um, and um, there is no one that I could think of better than her to um, reflect today on the dream of Dr. King manifested through people who use their hearts, <laughs> hands, and um, and love to uh, create change, establish change, and break barriers. And so, um, Mrs. Kennard, the first question I have for you is tell us about your various roles as an activist in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Joy. I would like to uh, start off by uh, thanking uh, Secretary Bassett for this opportunity and for Dr. Matthews thinking about me and uh, thinking that I have something to say. And certainly I want to thank you for taking the time out from your busy schedule to be with us today. I think it's very significant that we're observing Martin Luther King, because even though I am younger than he, I think we grew up with some of the same values and some of the same desires to make the world a better place. I must say, when I was a child coming up in church, I think that's where I got my start in community activism because um, I don't know, it was something about the church back then and the parents back then who wanted their children to be involved in something greater than themselves. And they knew that one day we were going to be uh, somebody as Dr. King would say, and others, other uh, leaders would say, we were going to be somebody. So in my church there in Washington, DC, Trinity AME Zion Church, at that time we were located on uh, Park Road uh, Northwest. They have moved now to 16th Street. We had um, a pastor and people who worked with the children and youth and took us out into the community. And we saw some of the uh, issues in the community, homelessness, housing situations. We saw um, uh, the degradation in our communities and they wanted us to do something about it. There were elderly people who had no relatives to do things for them. At least they didn't come around on a regular basis. So they had us children and teenagers going to sweep off the steps, to pick up the trash wherever there were elderly people, to go to the store for them, and to um, watch children of parents who had to work. So they got us involved in doing something more than ourselves. As a matter of fact, in our church, the motto was God first, other second, self last. Mm. And so I've pretty much taken that wow. on as my mantra through my life. And I was blessed enough to have married someone who had that same feeling, that same gusto, because all my life I have been involved in some kind of activism as a child. We belong to the Unity Helping Hand Association, which was part of the Odd Fellows. I guess some of you in Washington, D.C. know about the Odd Fellows Home on Ninth Street Northwest. We would go there once a month for meetings. And um, 
we would do various things. And my parents had us in other organizations helping other people. And that's what we were trained to do. As I got older, of course, went to high school, still working in my church. We worked with the National Council of Churches. That's where when I was a teenager, I met Walter Fontroy, who was a young person then. I think he may have been a, um, at Howard University. And I may have been um, maybe 13 or 14 years old when I met him. And he was an activist then. So we would join in. Uh, various churches would participate because he was like a leader in the community, especially in the church community. And he was not that old himself. So I think what I'm trying to say is that there were so many of us because it was the climate of the times. And when you have uh, people with whom you associate when you're young, it's just like water rolling off of a duck's back. It's normal, it's natural for you, it's not a big deal. And that's the way we were raised. As I grew up, of course, I went to Livingstone College and was very active in the civil rights movement uh, down there. Of course, we're not talking about uh, my activism in North Carolina, we're talking about here in Washington. So I must say that I became engaged on my graduation day uh, from Livingstone College, John Kennard uh, put the ring on my finger as I was getting ready to uh, march in the procession on commencement day. So after wow. that, I married him six months later. That was in June. I married him in November and began a life of activism beyond compare. Uh, I must say to you at this point that I didn't have children right away. My first child was born, I guess, five years after uh, we got married. So I had plenty of time to travel. I had plenty of time to uh, find out about my community. I had plenty of time to decide what I want to do. Now, Joy, please stop me whenever you want to, because you see, I can go on and on. Do you want to stop me at this point? Well, if you could just say a little bit more about after you got married in That's your role, and then, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, that allows me to keep on going because that's the trend uh, where I wanted to go anyway. After I got married, uh, we moved to Anacostia in Southeast Washington. And of course, at that time, there were so many activists I remember there were so many issues. And when we first got married and moved there, uh, John worked for Southeast House. And of course, Southeast House was uh, a few blocks from where we lived. And uh, he was very active in the community, uh, of course, but that was his job being active. But it was my, not my job to be active. However, uh, still believing and still being committed to the community. It was, uh, I didn't waste any time joining in with groups that were doing something. I think the first um, group I remember joining was a group that was concerned about the drug uh, problem there in Anacostia. And so I uh, participated in the development of a drug treatment program. And that was very, very intense and very involved because we had to organize it from the ground level up. And I must say, once we organized it and hired the people, it was really a fabulous um, opportunity for the addicted people in um, Anacostia area of Washington. I continued to uh, become involved with the NAACP. And of course, the NAACP was very active back in those days. And um, I became the uh, coordinator for the youth for the District of Columbia. And of course, in that capacity, I had youth 
from all over Washington, D.C., and encourage them to participate in all kinds of uh, civil rights issues that the president of the the various presidents of the D.C. chapter became involved in. So that was activism on that level. Um, Let's end there. Let's okay. end there with this question because okay. I want to uh, pivot slightly because you were about to start, I think, to talk about some people um, that you worked with. And I know um, that um, you and dad knew John Lewis. You all knew um, Marion Barry, you know, that whole SNCC group, um, NAACP, um, Hilda Mason. Um, those are some of the people I remember, um, you know. Um, and so I want to ask you this question. Who do you remember working with that made an impact in the work you achieved in Washington, D.C.? Well, there were so many, Joy. At this point, I can't say there was one. Of course, during the Barry administration, there were so many uh, intellectuals that came to the city, uh, Black intellectuals, Black leaders. I mean, that was an opportunity to really grow. And um, so many people were involved. But in my community, and that's where I think uh, there were the um, welfare rights mothers, uh, because you all might not realize it, but the welfare system was not the way it is now. Back in those days, um, men and women had to struggle to uh, get on welfare and that thing. So I remember people like Etta Horn, mm -hmm. uh, Teresa Jones, Teresa Jones, Ben yes. Davis, and mm -hmm. others in the community of Anacostia who really made a difference. And I enjoyed working with them. Of course, there were others uh, that had more clout, I guess you would say, more name recognition. But people like Carolyn Gray and some of those, you know, it's amazing. Of And of course, a lot of you on this, um, in this uh, shop workshop now would not even have known me. And there's so many people in Washington who work so hard and have worked through the years and nobody knows their names. And it's not until we mention the names of the people with whom we have worked that it brings to mind when you think of them, oh yeah, I remember her, I remember him, I remember. So I always want to remember people like Jim Spate and yes. others who made things happen in the city but not with the same kind of recognition. So Joy, there were so many, many more that I could um, mention, but I think I need to stop there. Okay, okay. Um, I wanna uh, pivot again and um, ask you this question because I think it's exciting that over the course of your life, you've done so many different things. You've done work in Africa, you've done work in North Carolina, you've done a lot of work in Washington, but you're still connected and doing so much for the city through the Woodlawn Cemetery. And so I'd like you to tell us about the Woodlawn Cemetery project uh, that you are working on uh, as an activist now to really well, understand uh, let's put, put it in perspective for people who just don't know what you're doing at all. Well, you know, it's very interesting how I became interested in cemeteries. As a matter of fact, I was on Facebook. You know, I'm the Facebook queen. You are. I was, yes. <laughs> and I <laughs> happened to be on Facebook late one night. And I saw an article which said that in Washington, D.C., over off of Rhode Island Avenue, where the Home Depot is now, used to be a cemetery, Old Columbia Harmony Cemetery. And those bodies had been moved from that cemetery over to the new Harmony Cemetery as we know it now. And when they were excavating those 
um, burial sites, the some of the grave markers were just strewn and just left there by the people who were some, who had gotten the contract, I guess, to do those move, uh, removals. And of course, I hadn't thought anything about Woodlawn or anything else. I think God was preparing me for something greater. Then I got a call because at that time, you mentioned I had uh, a serve as historian for Washington, uh, Washington DC alumni chapter. I must say, I am also a past president of the yes. Washington DC alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. And I don't know if Nicole Jordan, our uh, uh, present president is on this um, meeting now or not, but I'm working with Woodlawn through the Washington DC alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. And this is how we, my committee, my historian's committee was asked to locate one of the founders of Delta Sigma Theta. They did not know where she was. And of course they didn't because she was buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. We found where she was and it did not take that long for us to find her because we just went online went into um, uh, the, the grave system and we found her. Of course, we called her Edna Brown Coleman, but her name was Mary Edna Brown Coleman. And so uh, Lucille Brewer, one of my committee people was able to find her now. So now that sort of sets the stage. We now, made a visit uh, to- uh, you okay. you you talked about Olive Jones and then you went straight to Edna. So for clarity. No, no I didn't mention Olive Jones. We have okay. found Olive Jones over at Harmony. I didn't right. focus on that, but now my committee did locate okay. Olive Jones. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. And uh, I must say that at that, I, I'll I'll talk about that if I have time later on. Okay. okay. So we found Mary Edna Brown Cole. My committee and I went over to Woodlawn Cemetery. And when we went there, we realized that it was an unknown treasure, an unknown burial site that people go by it every day and don't even know it's there. So, um, when we went in there, uh, gravestones were in disarray. It was not a place where we would have wanted one of our founders to be. And so that caused us some concern. And um, uh, I took my committee, we went out there, but we looked around, we saw, we did, we said something has to be done because we want Woodlawn Cemetery to be a place where we can bring uh, deltas from all over the country, uh, where uh, family members who have people buried there can come and it can be sort of, now I don't wanna say a show place, I don't wanna say a show place, but right now it's not where it needs to be. Not only do we have a founder there, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, has two founders buried there. Sarah uh, Merriweather Nutter and Marjorie Arizona Hill. We have one, the Deltas have one, the AKAs have two, and there's no telling who else in the Divine Nine are buried out there because there are more than 32,000 people buried on the 22 point five acre uh, space out there called Woodlawn. It is a beautiful space. As a matter of fact, I had Thomas Bowen to come out there with some people from his office. And he walked in, walked up the hill, and he was anesthetized 
at the beauty of that space, of those burial grounds. So what we're trying to do is to get the mayor to really commit to helping us to revitalize uh, Woodlawn Cemetery. Now, they have a board of directors, the Woodlawn Cemetery uh, board of directors has been um, working with it and maintaining it, but it, they're not many people. And so we're trying to call attention to it. Now, I'd like to say this, we want community people to help us, but I wanna let you know how we are organized. The Washington DC alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta sorority under the auspices of our president, Nicole Jordan, is responsible for the Woodlawn Collaborative Project. We have 14 chapters of Delta Sigma Theta sorority involved. We also have local chapters of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority involved. So we have thousands of women that come under my jurisdiction as the chairperson or coordinator of the Woodlawn Collaborative Project. We meet once a month to talk about how we can assist Woodlawn Cemetery and we need help. Now, I want to say something very quickly. I know we don't have time. I want you to know uh, some of the areas in which we are working with Woodlawn Cemetery. Now, we're not, we're not taking over Woodlawn Cemetery because the people who are volunteering and have been volunteering way before we even knew about it, they're doing a wonderful job as well as they can. But we as community people can do so much more for that outstanding burial ground. We're trying to bring community awareness to it. So we have a committee that's working on that. We have a landscaping committee that tries every month to get a group of people to show up at the cemetery and help do cleanings. We mow the lawn, we rake, we pick up limbs, we do that kind of work. And we need churches and we need organizations to help us. Single families, we don't care. We just want people to help us. As I said, uh, there are more than 32,000 records. So we have an historical data preservation committee. And what these women do is they uh, have the information in the database. We're trying to come uh, uh, develop a database with all of the names and how the people died, when they died and all of that. We have the information, but we're trying to put it in a database so that if you have a relative buried there, you can just go and find it. And uh, of course, that's going to take some work. Um, we also have a committee that's working on grants because we need grants. You know, there's no money for cemeteries. There's no money for cemeteries, but we're hoping that we can uh, find some money somewhere. Maybe we can get it under another some name or something, but we need to have something done. Then we have an oral history project because the a uh, man who's serving as the president of the Woodlawn Cemetery uh, uh, Board of Directors, he's 90 years old. He is 90 years old wow. and he has a vision. He wants something to happen good for Woodlawn while he is living. And so that's why I'm so pleased to be on this conversation with you today, because I'm hoping that out of this, there are some powerful people here today looking at me right now. And I'm hoping that you will understand the plight, not only of Woodlawn Cemetery, some of the other cemeteries around in the area, but we're talking about Woodlawn right now. So I want you to contact me 
Don't wait. I have, uh, we have committees that we need help. We need um, more community participation. Joy, am I running too long? I think I might be. So uh, I'll you, stop right you, now. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, we want to open it up for questions. Okay. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or put a question in the chat for Mrs. Kennard. I think Lopez, Dr. Matthews is going to monitor the chat and the people who have questions. Lopez, I think there's a hand raise. Yes, you don't and, mute. Uh, Jasmine okay. and Ellis, I've given you the uh, power to turn on your mic and camera. Hi, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been wonderful. My name is Jasmine Ellis and I am a graduate student at Howard. I am a master's student studying public history and African-American women's history. And I recently read the book that you wrote, uh, Dr. Joy Kennard uh, called The Man, The Movement and the Museum, The Journey of John R. Kennard as the first African-American director of a Smithsonian institution. Yes. Museum for Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis's class, Museum yes. and Archives. So I, my question, thank you. My question for you both is, what is the greatest lesson that Mr. Kennard taught you both about being a servant and a leader? Hmm. Um, there's so many. Uh, Ma, did you want to go first? Well, I just, uh, of course, <laughs> it might not be a fair question for joy, but I tell you, I <laughs> saw him in action, not just working for the Smithsonian. You know, he was also a minister and he would get calls in the middle of the night after having worked all day long, where if somebody's child was in jail, if somebody's child um, was on drugs and they needed him, and somebody was losing their house and they figured that he had contacts in the city and he had to, um, to do that kind of thing. So that activism is just in our blood. And I think that for people who were raised that way, that's just the way it is. And I think all my daughters have that, so, that same spirit of involvement in the community and Joy, let me, you can speak for yourself. I don't want to take that out of your hands, but I just wanted to get going first. Well, um, uh, thanks, Ma. Well, I, I would say there's so many things, but I think that what he taught me most is that we're on earth to make a difference. And um, it's funny because when I was writing my dissertation at Howard, my mother allowed me to use some of the love letters my father wrote her when he was um, doing um, mission work in Africa in our Operation Crossroads. He was in Kenya, um, Botswana, you know, just doing so many things in leadership to make a difference there. And he basically said, I hope we together have children who understand um, the plight of making a difference. And um, there's so many things he did, but I think just the impact of um, it's bigger than having a job. It's bigger than working for the Smithsonian, a world-class um, institution. It's bigger than living in a privileged uh, 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 state to be educated. You have to help someone. You have mm -hmm. to contribute in a way that outlives you. Um, and so I think that's what I, I learned. And, and that's what I also learned from my mother um, because um, I was 13 when he passed away. And there are lessons that um, I didn't forget that he taught me, but my mother taught me more how to survive in this country being a black woman. Um, and um, it's just not easy. Um, trying to um, really uh, be, uh, how should I say? Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Mom, but um, I would just say that uh, she taught me a lot more as an adult 
um, and it, it, it's just transcended and been helpful to me as I, I'm moving on my journey in life. Mm -hmm. so, Thanks for your question, uh, Jasmine. Thank Thanks, you so Jasmine. Much. Thank you. Wonderful. Hey, Jasmine. Um, so we have a question, well, comment and question from Ida Jones, who uh, another Elizabeth oh, Clark. Ida Jones. Hey. Jones. What? I Ida just talked Jones. to you yesterday. <laughs> She's the university archivist at Morgan State in Baltimore, and she says, uh, "Comment then question. Thank you for your work in the cemetery. This is a long-standing tradition of club women to ensure that our ancestors are honored." As for the local endeavor, is there an effort to connect with our regional efforts to crowdsource, raise attention to the racial responsibility of maintaining our final resting places? Mm. There is the Laurel Cemetery Project in Baltimore with Coppin State. Mm. And I'll come to you next, uh, Mr. Johnson, with your question. You know, we want to connect with any group we can. And of course, we're finding more and more um, groups are interested in burial sites. As a matter of fact, to, to learn about some things, I went to YouTube and just studied it, studied what I had to study on uh, YouTube, gathering information about burial grounds all over the country, how people accidentally stumble across uh, a cemetery, in the woods or just walking by or happen to see something. Um, and of course, uh, the cemeteries are underneath schools and churches and <laughs> they've just built over top of them. Yes. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. And there's a, like a coalition of people uh, interested in burial sites. So we're, we're willing and we would love to just link hands, especially the African-American burial sites. Yes. So I'm going to um, allow Michael Johnson to uh, turn on his camera and mic so he can either read his comment or ask a question. Great. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm Michael Johnson. I live over here, born and raised in Alexandria, Virginia, and about, uh, we have a cemetery over here that a lot of people don't even know about. It's the Fred Frederick Douglass Memorial Cemetery, and it was named after Frederick Douglass six months after his death. He spoke here in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, the cemetery was initially uh, founded in 1825. We have 2,000 wow. bodies that are buried in Douglass, but we only have records of 600. Uh, five years ago, my mother passed, and she kept telling me that I had ancestors in this old, abandoned, neglected cemetery. Uh, after her death, it took me about four or five months to really locate uh, my ancestors. Uh, I have about eight ancestors in there uh, on my father's side, and I have another 10 on my uh, uh, grandmother's side. Uh, so what I've done is I've mobilized and started a group called the SRG. That's the Social Responsibility Group. I put that group together because I work for the city. That group became a 501c3. I moved away because of my, I didn't want conflict of interest. And uh, by me pushing and having, uh, getting the local officials together, uh, we have raised, from the state, gave us $500,000. Oh to, my goodness. To fix wow. up Douglas. Douglas is, uh, it was flooding. Uh, half the headstones was knocked down. Uh, so right now we're in the process with the help of some students from Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis class All from right Howard there. University. We brought in a couple of interns that are going to help me document and restore. And um, also we have a newsletter that's coming out and I'll share that with everybody uh, at a later date because I have one coming up for February. But just to make it quick and simple, uh, whatever help you may need, please let me know because we also need help over here. And if it wasn't for uh, my guidance, well, not my guidance, let me say this, my uh, mentor and hardcore uh, relative, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis, I would probably have just given it up, but she stay on me to make sure that I'm uh, an activist, making sure that uh, I check in with her to make sure that we're doing everything uh, by the book and also getting the information on how we should restore that cemetery. 
Uh, right. We right. also just put in a grant with the uh, University of Virginia for another $20,000 because we're going to document step by step the process of them fixing Douglas up and also restoring it to a present more presentable place. We do have a, a building, apartment building and condos over here that was built on there. Yeah. And uh, I know some of those that are missing, the 1,400 that are missing, it's probably up under that building. You know, uh, as a kid, I played in that lot, but you couldn't really tell it was that many headstones because of the uh, vegetation that had grown. But uh, I would like to stay in touch. I think this is a great opportunity for us to make sure that we as black folks bring uh, recognition to our folks that came before us uh, and laid the groundwork for me to be here today. Thank you. Beautiful, so beautiful. I, I would you. like to say, Mike, that Frederick Douglass Jr. is buried at Woodlawn. So we need to talk. <clears throat> that would be really good. We and need I to talk. Now I'll put my uh, uh, contact information in the, in the chat. Thank uh, you very, very much. And I just want to say he's a student of Coppin State University. Oh, wow. Great. Oh, right now. <laughs> working with, uh, so working with Elgin. <laughs> Clues and uh, Abner Lewis Moon up there as well. So, oh yeah, Abner, uh -huh. <laughs> who is uh -huh. here today as well. So. Oh, great, um, great. So, um, next we're gonna we have a question from Tierra Sardine, who says, "Good evening. My name is Tierra Sardine, undergrad student at Howard University. My question is, who or what is your biggest inspiration, and what motivates you to?" Day. Oh, my biggest motivation and inspiration. You know, I think probably my age. My age is my motivator because I am 80 years old and I know I don't have that much long to um, to do what I really want to do. So, you know, that can be a motivator because you want to uh, make certain that the legacy you leave, there is someone there to pick it up. So my intent is to have things so organized that someone can just come right in behind me and pick up and carry it on. So uh, that is my, I hate to say myself is my motivator, but I, you know, God is my motivator and has been all my life. But uh, I hope that will answer your question. If not, let me know, and maybe I can go into more detail. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyone else with a question, please feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, I have a question okay. for you. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> just, uh, How do you stay motivated given just all of the things that you see in the news and in the press? It can be so depressing and just almost make you just want to give up. How do you no. keep motivated? I know, I know. You have to look beyond and look over what you're going through right now. And it's very difficult because it's like, you can't see the beauty in the forest for all the trees that are in front of you, but you just have to keep going and you have to be focused and you have to stay uncluttered in your mind because sometimes you can be so cluttered and you have to make lists because you find that when you don't make lists, there's so much in your mind. You say, I can't do all of this. It's too much for me to do. But then when you sit down and make a list, you find that there's maybe just 15 or 20 things. And you can knock those 15 or 20 things off. In, uh, in one day, you can knock off 10. And maybe another day, you knock off three or four. So you have to just plan your time, focus on what you have to do. Don't have your mind cluttered and uh, have some goals and just stick by those goals. And don't try to do too much at one time. Space yourself, manage your time, 
Those are things that you need to do as you walk through life. And you know what I'm concerned about? Now, I, I know I'm not supposed to be able to just do too much talking. <laughs> what I'm concerned about is the young people who are not motivated to follow us older people. I'm talking about people in their late 20s, 30s, 40s. Where are you? When I go to organization meetings, I see people my age. And sure, there should be people my age there because we've paid our dues to be there. But what about the active activism of people in their 20s and 30s? You don't see them. If they go to the meetings, they're just sitting back talking. I'm talking about being involved. So if you don't understand any more from what I have said to you today, is that I'm hoping that you will become committed to something that you can say that you, your life was worth living. Of course, you're going to have your family. You're going to do those things. But we've got to make the world a better place for our children and our grandchildren and people we don't even know. So I admonish younger people to please get in here. Don't say you're too busy. You're not any busier than those of us who are older. And I, I was young once and I still, I had my children and we, I took my babies with me to meetings. I, they, I had two oh, of them in, in um, uh, what do you call it? strollers. I had double strollers, had joy and hope in a double stroller and Sarah was walking and I, we, I would take them to the meeting so that when, instead of playing dolls, they played meetings. <laughs> they played meetings. They didn't play mothers. They played meetings, you know. So uh, <laughs> that's a laugh. But I guess that's all I want to say. There's just so much <laughs> that we need people to be committed to what those of us who are older have done. Our day is almost over. But we need others like you, Dr. Matthews, and some of the other people yes. here uh, in this session to take over so we won't feel bad about having to leave this earth. Wow. That you was that was a loaded comment. <laughs> that really was loaded with a lot of jewels. Thank well, you. I understand Mr. Alan Dokes has a question. Oh, and right. You have been given the power to turn on your camera and mic so that you can ask your question, Mr. Dokes. Alan Dokes, okay. Well, while we wait on that, um, Astrid Suarez Laureano, who I actually sent an email to, says, I am an undergrad student, junior history major at Howard University. I wanted to know how we would be able to volunteer to join these programs through Delta Sigma Theta, specifically who or where to contact for the oral history project. Also, what do you feel is the biggest obstacle you have had to overcome in your life. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> well, I think um, uh, how you can contact us, we do have a website, uh, woodlawndc.org. You can go to woodlawndc.org and uh, leave a message there for us. And we will get in uh, touch with you. Uh, you can contact me on um, Messenger and Facebook. Um, you can uh, contact me on Instagram, yes. mama.canard. Leave a message for me there. Or um, on uh, Facebook, uh, Let's Talk with Marjorie Canard. You can leave me a message there. So uh, there are just several places. And um, email macanard at hotmail.com. M A Kennard with one N at hotmail.com. I dig it. And I see uh, Ida Jones has raised her hand. And I'll mm -hmm. unmute myself for this one. So good afternoon, Kennard family and others in the chat. Uh, Dr. Matthews. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I was wondering, I would love to see a challenge to others of the Divine Nine. You mentioned two of them. Uh, both Alpha Kappa Alpha and Delta Sigma Theta, all of the organizations have youth guilds and or juniors, both elementary school and high school age persons 
who have service projects for both high school and elementary school. So that might be a nice kind of day to plan either around a Founders Day or some other kind of mutually agreed upon date that would be relevant to come out to the cemetery. Um, my ASALH branch does our pilgrimage to Woodson Cemetery plot in Bethel Duke in Maryland. Um, and so we really need to get them invested in kind of stewarding this. Um, in terms of owning this history, not so much listening to us lecture maybe, but also kind of being responsible stewards of this. So I'd like to see a challenge. I would pledge my organization's efforts, but I, I need to probably be more invested in the chapter before I do so. <laughs> but I would love to see a challenge be made to uh, others of the Divine Nine, because we all have service projects and we all have young people guilds. So yes. it'd be nice to see if that could be done across. The that would be that would be wonderful. Now we have had others of the Divine Nine to come out and participate uh, with us at the cemetery, and it's just a matter of uh, um, we we have on our website. We will be putting the schedule up, the new schedule. Uh, we don't go out in the winter. We will be going out again starting in April. So we'll go be out. April, May, June, July, August, and September. And then when the fall comes, you see, we don't need to do as much. And what we're trying to get the mayor's office to do is to assist us in uh, cleanups and having maybe some of the men from um, uh, the city to come out and help us do some things because there's so much that needs to be done. Well, that's great because there's actually a rich history to Memorial Day for African-Americans. That's the whole idea. Memorial absolutely. Day having the actual event and yeah. fixing the headstones and so yes probably absolutely. died off in the 50s or the 60s but there is a tradition there as well absolutely thank you I applaud you for your efforts you're making me look lazy <laughs> at, at your vintage this lady <laughs> <laughs> me too me too <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis has a question she can uh -oh, uh -oh. turn on her uh, camera uh -oh. and then after that we'll read Kiara Thomas's question Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope I'm coming through. Yes, wow. we can hear you. Hey, um, Dr. Student, how are you both? Doc, uh, Mr. Dokes is one of my students, and he's been frantically running around campus. He's trying to get access, but he texted me his question. Mr. Dokes is an active military student who is getting a master's in history at Howard, but what he is putting together is a virtual museum on the history of the ROTC at Howard. And oh. he is really working very hard to get um, um, objects, etc. But what I wanted Mrs. Kennard to know, and that Ms. Dr. Kennard, her daughter, is that you have a young man who's working very hard to pull together an innovative museum. And I think it's going to be part of that grant that Howard Received. I was wondering about that. Yes, I was but wondering about that. Mr. Jokes is doing a phenomenal job of talking and trying to get objects and trying to put together, if it's only five or six objects, as Mrs. Kennard said, and I'm quoting what he sent me, he believes firmly that this museum would be is being created to outlast him. And he thanked you for saying that, because this is the project he's doing, not just for my class, or as a historian, but as you said, so that this museum will be sustainable and that its impact will be long lasting. He's looking at the military history and um, Dr. Matthews did a book on it and he's using that book, but he's since going beyond that. So he wanted you to know, Mr. Doak said, he wanted you to know that there are people who are working on this kind of an innovative museum but his concern was, as you said, sustainability. And he yeah. again thanked you. I hope Mr. Dokes doesn't mind. He again thanked you for your efforts and your inspiration because you also talked to the class last semester. Thank, um, you. thank you very much. That's him. Uh, thank you very him. much. Dr. Clark Lewis, can, yes, um, by the way, I got your email. I'm going to respond to it before I leave today. Uh, no problem. But um, it, can you have him reach out to me because... I'd love for him to um, plan a trip to Tuskegee Airmen here because I think we have some items that could help um, him think in a larger way about what he's doing. In addition to the fact that there were Howard students that did become Tuskegee Airmen. 
and um, we may be able to loan him some collections for his digital um, uh, plans for the virtual museum. He just texted me, text me. He said, yes, absolutely. And he is on leave because he is uh, being uh, educated. I don't like that word trained as a fighter uh, pilot. I, I never get it right. But he is in the pilot corps, if I'm saying it right, of the U.S. Air Force. But he requested this leave to come to Howard. And he is anxious to work both as a historian, but to get young men in the ROTC, especially those in the Air Force, and I'm quoting him again, who don't see, and you would be surprised how many don't understand the rich history of African Americans in the military, particularly in the Air Force. So he thanked, uh, thanked them very much. And he's very interested in making sure that this, even if it's a small museum, it is a start that will then others will build on. And he says again, thank you so much, um, Mrs. Kennard, for your work and for being an inspiration to him. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Yes. Clark Lewis. Um, I'm just gonna read this comment. Uh, Bill Branch, uh, DC archivist says, let's push for making this a part of the Emancipation Day celebration. Oh! Right uh, now, <laughs> look at that, that Marjorie Kennard. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm speechless. That's I'm huge. speechless. That's and wonderful. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Secretary wow. Bassett, you heard that. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Um, yes, so Kiara Thomas, a freshman psychology major at Howard, just wanted to ask Joy. I was wondering if there was any part of writing your book that you found difficult. This can be in regards oh. to research, publication, or anything else. Thank you for this session. It was quite inspirational. Um, wow. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, it, a number of things were difficult, but um, I guess I would say I was shocked that uh, some of the people who I talked with, who knew my father and worked with my father talked about him to me in a negative way and it was almost like they just didn't care I was his daughter they kind of felt I should know he he um had some unique idiosyncrasies I guess <laughs> and um it was fascinating but kind of hurtful um to kind of hear people um talk about him in a negative light, but it helped me see that um, there was so much humanity to him and, and he wasn't perfect because some uh, women look at their fathers as these perfect people with, you know, um, just kind of a, a fairy tale kind of, uh, in a fairy tale kind of way that, you know, they were just these perfect people, but it just, stunned me at how um, some people who I, I highly respect uh, at the Smithsonian and even the museum field um, <laughs> were brutally honest with me. So I would say that was slightly difficult. Um, sometimes I couldn't get information that I wanted to get um, because I had to work during um, the time I was at Howard and uh, you know, like I wanted to go to South Africa to um, learn more about why my father was kicked out of the country during apartheid. And when he um, made this speech at a um, South African Museums Association conference. And so um, some of the people when I was at Howard were still alive in South Africa that were there at that conference. And, you know, I, I just found difficulty getting information from them uh, to include in my research. And so that is the one thing that I wish I had more funding to really do what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I would say those are the two things that I wish. Um, well, well, those are the two things. Well, the, the going, the traveling, but um, the, the surprises <laughs> that people, you know, kind of said some unique things was 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 quite interesting. So um, as you do your research, you you just never know uh, what's going to happen. Uh, so uh, I could say more, and maybe I'll say more 
later next month when I talk to Dr. Clark Lewis's class. Um, I think it's on the 28th. So. Well, um, <clears throat> we've reached the end of our time, however. Just want to do one thing. Magela to Hamilton mentioned that she's working on a project to beautify a local cemetery in Birmingham. Oh, and she wondered if oh, you all could have a joint virtual meeting to discuss insights and oh, milestones. So Lopez, can I mention this to her? We're having a uh grave um a grave site restoration training. Um my office is uh sponsoring a, a, a free training for anyone in Alabama, even in DC, if you want to come, it's next month. We're going to be using as a study the campus burial site at Tuskegee University. We're also going to use um, the burial site of some of the syphilis study victims in Tuskegee, and we're also going to Selma to um, two cemeteries there next month. And so we have um, a preservationist in the Park Service that's going to um, come up and lead that training. So I can give the information to Dr. Lopez and hopefully he can get it out to those folks who are interested. Awesome. And so to uh, end the program, I just want to uh, mention that Mrs. Kennard is featured in a chapter of your book. And if you could tell us the chapter yes. of the book that she's in, so people can check. Yes, out. I believe it's chapter three, and um, we go in. I go in deep talking about her grandparents, who are my great grandparents, who have connections to Tuskegee Institute, and so um, you know, it's just amazing that um, her grandparents went to college, and she followed in there footsteps of, you know, trying to uh, uh, just be better, do better, and, and help others in a unique way, variety of ways. So, um, yeah, that's so, it. Any final word for us, Mrs. Kennard, for us to take with us? Well, I just want to say thank you so much for having me at this session, and I hope that you will consider me again uh, from time to time to participate on panels or, you know, when you get old, people don't need you anymore. So uh, uh, maybe you'll find a way to need me, Dr. Lopez oh. Matthews. Oh. <laughs> I think we have well, other things always. to talk about. Always. There's so much more to talk about. <laughs> if so, I can find time. Now, I may right, not be able to find you're time busy. because I'm very busy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Secretary Bassett, do you have a comment? Um, this is really, really um, incredible um, session. And I'd like to say hi to everybody who joined. We do need your help. Lopez, we have a archive over there that needs people. Um, if you want to research, um, we have three commissions. We have the Martin Luther King Commission, the D.C. Emancipation Day Commission. We have now the Juneteenth Commission. And so if you all are a D.C. resident and you're interested in joining any of these commissions, please reach out to Dr. Lopez um, because we are now seeking new members. And, you know, if we have active members who work, we could definitely find time to support initiatives um, as the Woodlawn Cemetery. Um, it's exciting to know, um, Sarah, I've heard about this quite a bit now, and, and I think that we definitely have to figure out ways um, to partner and to use our government resources to um, help this um, along. And so thank, thank you wonderful. so much, um, and wonderful. thank you for what you do. And there's no way we can forget about you. Thank you so and much. And Joy, so I love my mom too. And you know, <laughs> and I hear Definitely. your admiration for your mom and it's um, very inspiring. So you, you guys keep the faith and we will um, talk soon, hopefully. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye everybody. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.